We start in Russia, where in a dramatic weekend, Vladimir Putin faced the greatest challenge to his authority since coming to power more than two decades ago. As mercenary, as mercenary, the mercenary Wagner Group leader and former ally, Igevny Prigozhin, launched a brief but damaging mutiny targeted at the Russian military leadership. While a deal brokered by Belarusian leader Alexander Lukashenko seems to have contained the immediate risk to the status quo in the Kremlin, questions remain as to what this means for Putin's leadership. Let's take a look now at some of the latest developments. Russian state media say the defense minister, Sergei Shoigu, has visited troops involved in the conflict in Ukraine. These are the pictures given out by the Russian defense ministry, which the BBC has not yet verified. No details have been given as to when or where the visit took place, but it's the first such reference to Sergei Shoigu since Wagner mercenaries mutinied over the weekend. The Wagner leader, Igevny Prigozhin, had denounced Sergei Shoigu as evil and demanded his removal when he ordered fighters to advance on Moscow. Also, financial markets in Moscow have taken a hit early on Monday. The ruble initially dropped to a 15-month low. Ukraine says it's reclaimed some 130 square kilometers from, um, from Russian forces on the southern front since the start of the counteroffensive. But there is still no public appearance of President Putin or the leader of the Wagner Group, Igevny Rigozhin. Well, Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky has called for countries to put pressure on Russia to end the war following the rebellion by Wagner mercenary forces. The longer Russian aggression lasts, the more degradation it causes in Russia itself. One of the manifestations of this degradation is that Russian aggression is gradually returning to its home harbors. In our conversations with leaders, we've exchanged our assessments of what's happening in Russia. We see the situation in the same way and know how to respond. Well, let's cross live now to our international editor, Jeremy Bowen, who's in Kyiv. Jeremy, how might we see Saturday's events affecting things on the ground in Ukraine? Presumably, morale has been affected on both sides of the battlefield. Yeah, it can't be good for Russian soldiers to, to look what's happening in their, among their commanders and, uh, and see the confusion and think, well, this is good for us. That's clearly bad for them and vice versa for the Ukrainians. They're clearly very encouraged by developments. However, you know, you've got to hesitate for a moment. It doesn't, political confusion and a failed mutiny in Russia doesn't immediately translate to success and sudden breakthroughs on the battlefield here in Ukraine because the Russians have been working very hard to build up their defenses and it's going to take a lot more than uh, a boost in morale to overcome them. Jeremy, we've been talking a lot about perception today and messaging coming from, from leaders on all sides involved in, in Saturday's events. You know, on Saturday we saw a raw power battle. Today we're talking much more on how the affected parties are trying to spin things. What are, what are you seeing in the relative silence of Vladimir Putin, but also what Vladimir Zelensky is saying? Well, this is clearly something which President Zelensky here in Kiev will be looking on with uh, a great deal of satisfaction. He had a conversation last night with President Biden and uh, I no doubt they talked a lot about exactly what this means. The Americans have said that cracks are appearing in President Putin's regime. But the thing you have to remember about authoritarian regimes is that even if they're damaged, they can continue, and President Putin does still wield internally a lot of power. The, what has changed, I think, is the way that he has faced the biggest challenge to his power in all the years since he took over as president, and frankly has not come out of it very well. So perceptions of Putin whether he still can present himself as the figure of stability and strength that safeguards Russia, which is very much the line in the official media. So the question marks now about how credible that will be to all those millions of Russians who clearly were very distressed about what was going on, feeling powerless about these scenes on their TV screens. 
Jeremy, as the next few days unfold, what will you be watching in order to assess how badly Putin's grip on power has been affected? For example, will you be looking to see what Beijing says or, or, or see what Putin's other allies say? Well, I think the whole world is going to try and reassess now what happens uh, to their perceptions of Russia and President Putin. And it's not going to be just a couple of days. It's going to be a long period, I think, over the, the course of the rest of the year and beyond to see how this actually unfolds and whether there will be more challenges to his leadership. But what is absolutely clear, I think, is that people now will be thinking about what will Russia be like without Putin? What will happen when the succession eventually does occur? And based on the evidence of the weekend and that failed mutiny, it is not going to be smooth. So NATO needs to think about how exactly it deals with a Russia that for some years to come may be fragile, angry, and also unstable. Jeremy, thank you for giving us your assessment. Jeremy Bowen speaking to us from Kyiv. Well, let's cross live to Olga Ivshina from BBC Russian. She joins us now. Olga, we've seen video purportedly of the defense minister, Sergei Shoigu, today. What message should we take from that if that video is real? Actually, if you watch Russian state TV, the picture you see is completely different from you have just described and Jeremy Bowen have just described, even though uh, I do think the way you describe events is qu uh, quite correct. But on Russian state TV, uh, this just looks as a, you know, a small group of uh, rebels stabbed on the back, but Mr. Putin uh, was totally in control, reacted briefly, still strong, and still huge support by his, uh, by his population. That's the message Russian State TV tries to spread. But the very fact that they actually reported, uh, that they actually reacted very quickly, so Putin's ad address came uh, less than 12 hours after the first statement of Yevgeny Prigozhin and the first uh, emergency sort of breaking news bulletin appeared just, I think, two or three hours after the initial statement. That's incredible speed for Russian State TV. They usually take pause. Um, Putin doesn't comment on the breaking news. So it, the, the speed means that the system was clearly shocked and they're trying to respond and they, uh, you know, they, they try to provide the strongest response uh, they can. And as we know, Mr. Putin never wobbles under pressure publicly. He never, uh, you know, he, he never sort of, um, uh, he always shows that he keeps his allies close to him. And this is once again a reinforcement mm. showing that Shoigu is still uh, a minister and Shoigu is still operational. That's his usual tactics. But the speed uh, of those messages tell them how much system was shocked and maybe even scared. Olga, let's focus on Igevni Prigozhin for a moment. Before Saturday, can you just reflect on how he was portrayed by the Russian state media, how Wagner Group was portrayed to ordinary Russians? I think it's very important to remember that Wagner appeared not now. Wagner Group appeared in 2013, and they have been the shadow force of Russia for for a decade now, operating in first in, Donba in um, uh, Donbass, in Donetsk and Lugansk parts of Ukraine, then in Syria, Libya, Africa, and then again in Ukraine as a part of the large-scale invasion. And only from May last year, they actually started appearing on state TV. Before that, they were non-existent. Uh, and they only appeared when uh, Russian forces were having significant troubles, significant losses, and actually uh, Russian side needed more records. So the very fact they, they started to be named was a desperate attempt to get more records, more people to, to join the forces, uh, including Wagner. Uh, so uh, uh, that, that's how they appeared. And of course, they were always shown as uh, our, our boys, uh, how Russia TV called them. Uh, most of the time, they were never named. They were either called our boys or musicians because uh, sort of playing, cross-playing with this Wagner name. Uh, and I think it's also very important that when Putin made his um, 
urgent address on Saturday, he didn't call them by name. He didn't say Prigozhin, uh, uh, which, which is, again, his usual tactics. He, he tries not to provide ad additional credibility to his uh, enemies by uh, calling their names. Um, so at the moment, um, uh, it, it's, it's a hard situation. Russia still needs records, still needs foods on the ground in Ukraine. Uh, that's why they have taken this uh, middle approach, saying it was a mutiny, but it was a betrayal of of their leader, not the Wagner forces itself. Wagner are, are still seen and portrayed as sort of as the good guys.